here this morning. Welcome to week two of the Room with the Garden view. Our scripture reading for today is Genesis chapter two, verses four through nine, and then verses 15 through 25. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called a woman, for she was taken out of a man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Praise God. Can we go God praise for his word today? Thank you, Bria. All right. Um, so we tried something different today. If you're new with us, then you didn't notice if you've been with us for a while. We did a recap video from last week to save some time on kind of just catching you up of last week, which all that meant is that I have more jokes that I can tell you today. Would you like, would you like to hear a joke? Anybody want to hear a joke? Um, all, right, all right. So uh, well, let, 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 me, let me, we'll get to the jokes. Okay. Let, we'll get to the jokes. Let me just start by giving you just a small thing. This is an eight week series and it is um, on some common teachings we've taught over the last probably year that we've learned needed to be compiled into a single um, kind of series. And there's one big takeaway of the entire series. So if you learn nothing else, there's two things you need to learn today for the most part. And this is the first one, that when we do not know the truth, any story can become our narrative. Okay. And we give this example where if someone comes to you and says, hey, listen, I got some information. I'm going to tell you some of it, but I can't tell you the whole story. Does anybody else hate that besides me? When somebody comes to you, like, I can tell you, but I can't tell you the whole story. Well, the truth is this. If you don't tell me the whole story, I'm going to just make up what the rest of the story is. I mean, you can't help but do it, right? Like, if someone says, I'm not giving you the whole, whole story, you're not going to just think about the story in part. You're going to fill in the gaps with other information that you've heard, with maybe your own conclusions. And so then they get mad because you misjudged something because they gave you part of the story. I believe the church and believers have settled for a narrative and formed one that isn't fully what we think it is because we've been lied to about our narrative. If you don't know the truth, then you'll actually uh, begin to settle for anything. Any story can become your narrative. Okay, now I'll give you a joke. We are talking about Adam and Eve. So there was a little boy named Little Johnny. Little Johnny was in Sunday school when he was, I'm pretty sure he was in Sunday school at First Baptist Columbus, Georgia is where he was. Yeah, he was there. And uh, he, um, uh, by the way, I said that because we actually have a whole group of college students from First Baptist Columbus. Can we make them feel welcome, church? Yeah. 
We'll, we'll talk about them a little bit at the end, but um, he's at First Baptist Columbus. He's in Sunday school, and little Johnny's hearing the creation story, and they're telling the creation story, and he gets really attentive when it gets to that part where they remove the Adam from the Adam, remove the rib from Adam and create the woman, and he gets super attentive, and his Sunday school teacher notices. Well, a couple of days later, um, little Johnny's not feeling good, and he's laying on the couch, and he's really hamming it up, and his mom finally comes to him and says, little Johnny, what's wrong? And he goes, I got a pain in my side. I think I'm about to have a wife. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. It's not actually how the story goes. But I do have another question for you. Think about this. Why did Adam and Eve have belly buttons in every painting we've ever seen? Some of y'all don't understand that, but think about it. Why did, anyways, all right. So I don't want to confuse you. We're going to go back and forth on a piece of language, three pieces of language, and I want to explain two of them. You'll hear us talk about the garden a lot, the kingdom a lot, and heaven a lot. And heaven and the kingdom are different things, and we're going to talk about that. But the garden is the kingdom. So if you hear me refer to the garden, you could replace it with the kingdom of God. If you hear me say the kingdom of God, you could replace it with the term the garden. You see, the kingdom is a place where God is placed in his rightful position as king. And where we, as sons and daughters of that king, co-labor with him in this kingdom. It basically it's this. It's an alignment with God's initial desires and plans for our life. The kingdom of God is the culture of heaven complementing God's creation on earth. This is how it was created in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When he said and in the rest of Genesis, it was never these conflicting things. It was supposed to be complementary things, right? Like he created something and something, and they were meant to go together instead of standing in contradiction to each other. But for some reason, along the way, because if you don't know the truth, we will build our own narratives. We have put heaven and earth at, at, at a point where they actually stand contradictory to each other, right? We even sing songs like, don't give me the things of this world, but give me Jesus, right? We, 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 we separate the world and God. And that's not how it was initially meant to be. God didn't create the earth on accident. He created it with great purpose. And there was a place where the culture of heaven landed on the earth he created, and we call it the Garden of Eden, right? Like this was where we saw God in his rightful place. We saw the things of God flourishing, and we saw a man and woman living in it. So here's every message in this entire series in one sentence. God's initial intent is his final decision. God's initial intent, how he did things and longed for things to be in the beginning, is his final decision. So this entire series is me showing you different things that I believe was God's initial intent. And if we can set our eyes on what God initially desired, then we can try to get back to what he would have for our lives. The way I explained it last week was, you know, the best way for me to lose weight is to see a picture of me when I was married in 2009, right? Because I see what I can be, right? Like I saw what my chin could look like and a jawline and things like that. And so now I want to get back because I know what can be, right? Now, have you ever heard the term a fair weather fan? Anybody know what that means? So it means someone who changes their commitment depending on the quality of the team. Oh, Brandon's pointing out people in the front row, right? We got some here? Okay. Um, in, in Alabama, we don't have any professional sports, really. So we are really bad about being fair weather fan of professional sports because we have no commitment outside of maybe some down in history friend or family member that lived in that light. And so when teams don't do the quality they thought that we should, they should, we quit supporting them. Um, I remember when I was growing up, um, it, it was the Braves, man. Everybody was a Braves fan until they weren't a Braves fan anymore, right? And that's how it was. Well, here's what I want you to know about God. God is not a fair weather God. And what I mean by that, God doesn't just love you and support you in your best. He, like, like when you and I were resembled in the garden as Adam and Eve and God was with them, none of that has changed. God did not withdraw his presence from them. Actually, we're not teaching it today. But do you remember what happens after Adam and Eve sin? We'll talk about it a little bit. And they go and hide. Do you know what happens? God comes looking for them. He doesn't come looking for them with a, with a whip. He doesn't come looking for them with some kind of anger. He comes looking for them, and he says, where are you? See, God is always for you and will always stand beside you. 
So today, I'm just going to tell you, we're going to be in Genesis 2 and 3. If you have a Bible, um, I'd pull that out. If you have eyeballs, you can turn them to the screen. If you have a phone, while you're playing Angry Birds, you can follow along on your Bible app. Um, if you don't have a Bible, listen, you don't have to leave here and go buy one today. We have free ones. Just grab one as you leave today or get up and get one now. Um, either way. And then in your seat, you have a worship guide. And we always ask the same four questions of a collectivist. If you're new with us, we ask the same four questions for one simple reason. It's how I study the Bible. So if you're like, I don't know how to study the Bible, hey, try this. Ask four questions when you read scripture. What's God wants you to know? God wants you to know something today. Like the God who created everything wants you to know something. And then ask, why does he want me to know it? Because God doesn't just give information for us just to have. He has a reason behind it. And then what does he want me to do? Because all godly information deserves a good response by his believers. And then what will be the results if we do or don't do those things? So we're going to ask those four questions. So today we are in week two, and we're looking at the fall of man and answering the question, what was the fruit that they ate? Have you ever wondered that question? Right, like we know, now let me back up. I know that the fruit isn't near as important as what happened. They sinned because they did what God told them not to do, and that caused the fall of man. I get that. I'm not belittling that. But don't act like you don't wonder what that fruit was, Right? We're going to answer that question today. So what's God wants us to know today when it comes to the fall of man? Well, a couple of things first, kind of some precursors to it. Number one, he wants you to understand that God's heart reveals God's intent. God wants you to know that if his initial intent is his final decision, we find out his intent by realizing what is his heart. And I'm going to tell you what's his heart according to Genesis 2 and 3 and also in accordance with the rest of Scripture. God has a heart to provide like, God loves to be the provider. We have anybody here who just loves to be the provider? Anybody? Like, like it's just kind of part of who you are. Like, you got to be the provider. Genesis 2 says, The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree. So we get the picture right. This whole garden is full of trees. There's not just one tree. There's lots of trees with lots of fruit that are pleasing to the eye and also good for food. And in that garden, in the middle, he plants a tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. God's desire in this moment was to be the provider. He actually created the provision first and then put us in there. Well, how generous was that? He, like, man, didn't you have to go hungry for five days, right? Like, like I was like, I'm going to create you on day six because I know you like to eat, right? And so he had everything ready. But listen, many of us have gotten a poor narrative of God, but the truth is if God is not trying to withhold things from you, he's trying to be generous. Like when we think on the story of the Garden of Eden in Genesis 2 and 3, we often think about how God said, you can't eat of this tree, and we forget that God created all kinds of trees that were pleasing to their sight and was good for food. And he goes, but there's this one tree that I don't want you to eat. Um, and you're like, God, you're so cruel. <laughs> why would you do that? Like, why would you tell me I can't eat of that tree in this forest garden of trees? That's just mean of you, right? But we, we don't understand. Well, let's back up a little bit. Um, can I, I'm going to go ahead and just fix some poor Bible teaching. Some of y'all just learned for the first time that there were two trees named in a garden. And you're like, not me. Well, maybe not. It wasn't long ago that I learned this. I knew God created everything. I knew there was this forbidden fruit tree. And I read, and he names very particularly two trees. One was the tree of life, and one was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he says, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. But obviously, if you eat of the tree of life, you will live. And there's these two trees sitting in the middle of the garden. And I don't know how I missed it for all my life, but I like, wanted to call my pastor after I found out. I was like, what? why did you not teach me this, right? See, God longed to offer a life forever in the garden. It was centered around life and everything that came from it. God didn't want them not to eat. The truth is, and we're going to under, un unpack why, God didn't want them not to eat. He actually wanted them to eat forever, which is why God's not only a provider, but God also has a heart to protect. God creating all the trees, God creating all the things that were good, showed his providing heart. God saying not to eat of this one tree shows God's heart to protect. Genesis 2, 17, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, God tried to warn them, we're going to talk about this next week, that death always catches up to sin. That's what he was saying. He was saying, listen, 
Scripture says the wages of sin is death. And we've unpacked this as a church before, but if you haven't been here, um, we, the payment for sin was death with Jesus. But it's because the wage of sin, and the wage is something that is produced, right? If you work a job and you worked eight hours, you have produced an eight-hour payment that you should receive. And if you don't receive it, you're going to receive it, right? Like if you worked eight hours, your boss is like, yeah, sorry, I don't have it. You're like, no, 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 you don't understand. Like I work the hours, which means I get the payment, and sin is the same way. It's that sin produces death. And if death doesn't catch up to sin, sin says, no, no, you don't understand. I am sin and death is my wage. It will catch up. And Jesus is saying, listen, I don't, God is saying, I don't want you to sin. I don't want you to eat of this tree because I know that death always catches up to sin. And it's not because I don't want you to eat. It's because I want you to eat forever. I want you to eat all of this. So, God tried to. God's heart and initial intent reveals his nature. Okay, so that's the first thing God wants you to know. The second thing I think God wants you to know is that God's heart reveals our intent. So God's heart reveals his nature, and his nature is to provide. His nature is to protect. But God's actual heart reveals his intent for our heart as well as our creator. And these are the things he gave us for our intent. He actually gave us a heart for purpose. You know that drive in you? When you feel unfulfilled because you don't have a purpose? God put that in the beginning. It says, the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground and of the wild animals, all the birds in the sky. He brought them to man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. Even when he said silly ones, right? Like, you know, like when he named all the dinosaurs, those were just ridiculous names, right? Whoever, whoever decided, let's just shorten it to T-Rex, they're my hero, right? You know. Anyways, the man gave names to all livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So God gave him a purpose, and that was initial. In your heart, you have purpose. But what this also shows us is that your purpose cannot substitute your heart to be loved. And many times, when we don't feel loved, we just go after purpose. And many times when we don't have purpose, we go after love. And God's showing us these two different things. Listen, he gave you, us a heart for partnership. Now, I mean this within relationships as in like marriages and things like that. But I also just mean in general, God has called you and wired you as partnership. Peter talked about multiplication earlier. Um, multiplication could only happen in relationships. So, like, if I am deciding to take on a task, like, we as a church, we are here because we believe in partnership with each other. We would, if we wanted to think that our impact could be um, better without everybody, then I would just go around and just from street corner to street corner telling people to repent and to believe in Jesus. But we know that it's better together. We know that it multiplies that way, right? And we want to see God do great things. So the Lord God calls the man to fall asleep. And while he was still sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now my bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife, and they become one flesh. See, a partnership, I'm just going to, we're going to go on a sidetrack. So just for a second, relationships, marriages here, just for a second. Those who, if you're not married and you're going to be like, like everybody take, hear this out. Relationship in the garden when it came to Adam and Eve, a healthy marriage um, was based around the idea of service. The best marriages aren't the ones where you wake up and still feel butterflies every day, but it's ones where you wake up and you try to outserve each other. Right? Like Billy Graham says the good marriages are, are based off of who can forgive the other the most. And I'll add to that and who can serve the other the best. Try to outserve each other every day. And if you do that, you're going to find yourself in a relationship that is thriving. All right. Anyways, number three. So we know God, God's heart shows his intent. God's heart also shows us our intent. We kind of see what our hearts are. And here's the truth. The other thing God wants you to know, the third thing God wants you to know, is that the garden or the kingdom is experienced when our hearts are aligned. So when God's heart, his intent, is aligned with our hearts, how he created us to be, when those things are aligned, that's when we begin to see the kingdom of God, the garden, begin to flourish in your life. Genesis 2, 25, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. I know that's a weird verse to put up there for this. 
Because I think it's probably the most shocking verse in Genesis, right? Well, not in Genesis, in creation. This, this idea that they could stand there before God and feel no shame naked. Now, I am going to ask that every week y'all please keep showing up in clothes, right? Like, 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 don't want that kind of garden here, like, right? Like, everybody show up fully clothed. But it shows us like a, just this big contrast of today, right? That they could stand there before God in a place of freedom without the fear of being judged by God. And they stood before each other with no desire to judge each other. Their hearts were aligned with God's heart. And there was a place that looked quite different than the world we live in. Now, we as a church, we, we are trying with all of our hearts to create spaces that this can exist, not the nudity in front of each other part, but um, the living together in great companionship with God. We say it this way, with God, in community, to the world, and that's what we do with our missional community. So if you're looking for um, people to partner with in life and for uh, God to be at the center and for missions to be your engine, find one of those. And then the fourth thing God wants you to know is, okay, we got his heart, right? That's his intent. We got our heart. That's his, what he gave us. And, and when those are aligned, we see the garden. We see ki- the kingdom. But then I want you to understand this. Aligned hearts only come from mutual trust. Right? Your, your hearts won't be aligned unless you have mutual trust. And now, here's what it looks like with God. Um, mutual trust, at least. Um, mutual trust with God was when God created everything and he gave you the will to make the choice. God trusted that you would actually consistently hold true to your word. Adam Eve, I created everything, everything's good. After I created everything good, there's one thing, I don't want you to eat of that thing. Um, he didn't even say it was bad, I just don't want you to eat of it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it that you're going to keep your word. But then also the trust for us to trust God means that we have to trust that God's word is constant and true. Here, here's what I mean by constant and true. I think Adam and Eve looked at all the things God created and said you could have and said, oh, that was good of God. But then we get to the one thing he says they can't have, and they say, I think he was wrong about this one thing. See, as believers, if one thing God says is true, then he, we must trust that everything he says is true. See, but instead of trusting God, I think we've begun to judge God. We judge what part of our lives we can actually trust him with. But here's the problem. God cannot transform a life that's not submitted to him. Why wouldn't he do that? Like, that seems cruel of God. Why won't God transform things unless they're given to him? Because he's not a thief. So anything that's submitted to God in your life, he will transform it. And I believe that because I believe that some of the words of God are true. So that means I believe all the words of God are true. And so if God will transform some of the parts of my life, I have to believe that he'll transform all of the areas that I submit to him. But we've begun to judge, what do we give to God? Right? So why, why does God want us to know this? Second question, why does God want us to know this? We have to understand this because the first thing we will face, just like in the garden, is that Satan will question God's word every time God speaks it. Now look at Genesis 3. I love this story. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals. And the Lord God had made, and he said to the woman, did God really say? Ever had that come through your head? God has told you something on a Sunday morning. You wrote it down on the back of your notes. God has told me this. And then on Monday when you wake up and you're nowhere near those notes and you're driving to work and the first thing you hear is, did God really say whatever it was? It happened actually, Jesus, Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, comes out of the Jordan, ah, the heavens open, a dove comes down and says, this is my son. And four verses later, he's out of the river and he's in the desert and Satan comes and tempts him and says, if you're really the son of God. See, God, Satan will always question what God spoke. And he says, the kids are okay. That's a good, that's a good life back there that you're hearing, by the way. Um, <laughs> just next week, anyway, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, you must not, did God really say you must not eat in, from any tree? So he knows, but he's like, let's get her talking, right? Did God say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? He knows that God didn't say that. But then now she has to respond, and she goes, no, 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 no. We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but now that you speak of it, he did say we must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. And Satan goes, oh, that's ridiculous. You'll not certainly die. 
the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. And then ding, 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 that makes me want to do this now. Now I can be like God, knowing good and evil. You see, if we stop trusting God's word, we become unaligned with God's heart. And unaligned hearts lead to selfish decisions. So we, we, we need to know that Satan's going to question everything God speaks. And when we stop trusting the things that God speaks, it's going to lead to unaligned hearts. And unaligned hearts will lead to selfish decisions, right? If me and my wife's heart is not aligned, then I'm going to start making decisions not based on our relationship, not based on her, but based on what I would like. And so when we become people who are unaligned with God's heart, we no longer are making decisions based on the kingdom of God, no longer making decisions based on our Christian faith. We're no longer making decisions based off of what's good for God. We're no longer making decisions based on what God would have for us. We're making decisions based on us, forgetting that every decision God's made is for you. Genesis 3, 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her stupid husband. I mean, just her husband. He wasn't stupid. He wasn't. That happened after the fall. We became like that. No, I'm just joking. Look at this, though. You missed this. Somebody didn't teach you this. Your pastor didn't show you this. Who was what? Say it again. Look at that second line. Adam was what? Oh, my goodness. I thought that she was by herself when she ate this. And then, no, he was there. And he also ate it. You see, if you don't trust God's heart, then you will live a life that is misled by your heart. Satan says, you, di- you won't die. It, and, and by the way, it was a gracious God who was actually not trying to kill you, but stop you from living forever in your sin. It wasn't that eating this fruit of this tree was poisonous. It was that we would sin. And then guess what's right next to the tree that caused our sin? The tree of what? You remember? Life. So now we go to the tree of life and we continue to eat of life while we're living in our sin. And God said, I don't want you to live forever in your sin. That's why the tree killed them. Because God didn't want them to live forever in their sin. Do you know what living forever in your sin is called in the afterlife? That's hell, by the way. Hell is where you go to pay for your own sins. But the good news for us We know, fast forwarding the story, that we have to step over Jesus to get to hell. And that Jesus has made a way for us to not have to live forever in our sin. It was graciousness of him that cast us out of the garden, put us in a place, this holding pattern. We're going to talk about next week, the holding pattern. We're going to talk about the old covenant. It's going to be a lot of fun. Until he could redeem things back. Okay. Selfish decisions. So, So remember, Satan will question everything God spoke. And when we begin to not trust God's word, we get, um, we get unaligned hearts. We have unaligned hearts. We then make selfish decisions. And when we make selfish decisions, it results in burdens that we should never bear. All right, so I'm just going to, we're going to show it really here just, just, just to make sure. So we have our hearts, right? That's my beautiful drawing of a heart. Our hearts, when they be- don't trust God and become unaligned, then they will always lead to selfish, selfish decisions, which then will lead to burdens every time. This right here is the fall of man. There's a a consequence that came with sin. It was death. And there was a graciousness that came with God, which was the covenant, which we're going to talk about next week. But there is a burden that comes with the particular sin. And have you ever heard the term, the punishment matches the crime? You ever heard that, right? Like, that's why my mama washed my mouth out with soap, right? (laughs) Because the punishment matched the crime. The burden also matches the crime here. So we can see the burden once we identify the fruit. So what was the fruit? What was the fruit? That's what we're here. That's why you came. I told you I was going to tell you what the fruit was. What was the fruit that they ate and what was the result of that fruit? The fruit was the knowledge of good and evil. But I know you want to know what the actual fruit was. Now you're mad at me because I didn't tell you an actual physical fruit. Uh, it's a pear, okay? It was a pear. It was a pear. Here's why it was a pear. Because pears seem delicious. But then once you bite into them, the texture reminds you of eating a cat's tongue, right? And so that's, that's why it was a pear. Only, only a pear could be it because it, it tastes great. But then again, it reminds you of eating a cat's tongue. And y'all know how I feel about cats, right? Like some of you do. If you don't know then you don't, you just don't, don't worry, don't worry about it. Um, 
You see, our ability to choose a life different than God's initial intent has led to burdens that actually you and I were never meant to bear. These burdens were not a burden to God, but we wanted to be, do you remember what Satan said? Like who? God. So then we had to take on things that when not shouldered by God is a burden to man. And the burden that came with the knowledge of good and evil was this. And by the way, if you were here during the 30 Pieces of Silver sermon series, we gave a whole message on this. I'll be using a lot of that information, so you're going to get it double here. The burden that came with the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil is judgment. That's what came. That's why we refer to God as the judge. Because judgment is not a burden for God. Because he's a righteous judge. But it is a burden for us. It's a burden. And I know you don't think it because some of us really enjoy doing it. (laughs) But it is. It's the burden that makes us become the judge. And see, the problem is we actually traded God's judgment, his view, for being judged by God. See, we wanted the ability to go through life and to be like God instead of submitting to God who loves you and whose initial intent was for your life, who was literally desiring for you to have heaven on earth. But then we wanted to go around and judge for ourselves. God said in Genesis 3, 5, for God knows that when you eat from from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. You see, we traded the sovereign judge for selfish ambition. But with knowledge of good and evil comes the natural burden of having to classify things as good or bad, right? And so, look, this is what Billy Graham says. He says, it it is the Holy Spirit's job to convict, God's job to judge, and my job to love. Now, let me tell you what this message is not. This message actually isn't a message that's telling you not to judge. Believe it or not, I'm not here to tell you not to judge. If you could do that, I would love for that to happen. If we could all give God the rightful place as judge and not judge, I would love for that to happen. But we've taken on the knowledge of good and evil, which makes the burden of judgment something that happens. So instead, I want when we look at the judgment of others, the judgment of God and the judgment of ourself, which is the part that we see um, the most burdensome in our life, I want to make us the best we can with that knowledge and with that burden of judge. So the burden of being judged as well. See, I wrote this in my journal this week. A lack of ignorance invites accountability. When I don't have information, you can't hold me accountable of it. Right? Like if I don't know, like if my kid does something that they didn't know was wrong, I'm not mad at them. Because they didn't know. But when they know and they do it anyways, can you believe this? At one point, we got to live life as a people who didn't have to be held judged because we had nothing that had to be judged because we didn't have the knowledge. But now that we have the knowledge, when we don't align with what God would have us do with the knowledge, then all of a sudden, now we're being held accountable. See, we brought judgment on ourselves Because we wanted to be like God and judge others. So what does God want us to do? I'm going to help us become healthy judges if we're going to judge at all. We'd love for God to become the judge and give everything to him. But if you're going to judge, I want you to follow his ways and not your heart. I want you to follow God's ways and not your heart. Um, So look at this with me. I'm going to try this again. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on uh, on, on your own understanding. We say it this way. Emotions are an okay gauge, but they're a horrible guide. I say that probably once a month, right? And it's because I think back on high school and college, you know, every poor decision I made back then were based off of poor emotions. I let emotions guide me. The, the, the meanest things I've said to my wife, which are not very mean things. I've been very loving to my wife in my entire relationship. But was when my emotions were what? High. When I acted unlike I should as a father to my children, were my emotions in check when I did that? No. Because I'm a good dad, y'all. But when I follow my emotions, I can be a very bad dad. Right? Because emotions will always mislead you. But Satan will manipulate and lie to us, which leads our emotions to steering our life. So trust God, not your heart. How do we do that? Go to God with everything. Like, go to him with everything. What do you mean everything? I mean everything. I mean everything. Because we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against, look at this, the knowledge that we got. Everything that goes against the knowledge of God, we take it captive and make every thought to make it obedient to God. 
Not to our hearts, not to our feelings. We're gonna say, hey God, like listen, I have this knowledge now, but I don't have the understanding. So I'm gonna compare it to what you would say and not what I would say because I wanna make it obedient to you and not my feelings. The second thing I think we need to do besides just taking everything to God is actually to make margin out of humility. What do I mean by that? I think we need to learn to walk humbly and to have margin in our life for that. And it's actually for your good. Look at this. My favorite passage is in the world. Colossians 3.13, make allowance for each other's faults. Now, some of y'all don't like that. I love that. I love that scripture says to actually give some margin, give some room for other people's faults. Because guess what's going to happen? People are going to get sin against you. And when you have no margin and you're on the edge of the line, what happens when someone sins against you? All of a sudden, you're falling over the line, right? So you say, hey, why don't we make some room? Why don't we give some space? Why don't we give some margin and learn to forgive anyone who offends us? Remember, if you can't do that, that you were forgiven, so you must forgive others. Now, some of you are here, and I get it. If we were having a private conversation right now, you'd come to me as your pastor, and you'd say, but you don't understand. I'm a good judge of character. Let me pause for a second. What I'm about to reveal to you was the most mind-opening clarity I've had in this series so far. Many of you would say, I'm a good judge of character. Some of you would say, I'm a good judge of right and wrong. Or you say, I'm a good judge, and you would go on and go on and say things. I've had this conversation before. I mean, I just have, I have re- I'm really good at discernment. I have the spiritual gift of discernment. I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that you're a good judge compared to the person next to you. But can I tell you something? You're not a good judge. You're not a good judge. I'm not a good, well, I, I don't care how good you are in your judgment on earth compared to the judge, you're a bad judge. And I'm going to tell you why. And I'm telling you, I'm about to, if it doesn't blow your mind, then I'm at the wrong church. I need to go somewhere else because this blew my mind. Here's how I know. Let's recap. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. For five days, he created things. If you've been with me in this series or you know the book of Genesis, after everything he created, he looked at it and said it out loud with me. He called it what? Good. Okay. God created and he called it good. Day one, created, it's good. Day two, good. Day three, good. Day four, good. Day five, good. Then he created you and me, Adam and Eve, placed them in a garden. He looked at them and he said it is what? Very good. All things, right? So he created good. So there's a paradise. It's perfect, right? This is God's initial intent. It's not today. We have bad things in the world today. Don't mishear me. But there was good. And then there was Adam and Eve, and everything was good. And then Adam and Eve took on the knowledge of good and evil. And can I tell you, it should have changed nothing for them because everything was what? Isn't that crazy? They took on the knowledge of good and evil in a world where everything was already deemed good. And when they came to the knowledge of good and evil that was deemed good by the great judge on high, all of a sudden they began to find things that weren't good. How? How do you do that? Because we're bad judges. I'll see you back next week. No. <laughs> It blew my mind. If Adam and Eve can find bad in a world that was perfect and good, then how are we to think that we've judged everything correctly in this world? Now, (laughs) you have to understand, we now do have this burden of judgment, and we should not only be so cautious in our judgment. This is my journal this week. You don't have to write down. But we should also be very humble in our conclusions. Here's what I mean. I just, this is actually what I wrote down. I, I shorthand in my journal. I wrote, cautious in judgment, humble in conclusions. Now, again, I've already had this conversation every week. Y'all are going to email me, and you can email me. We can have coffee, and you're going to ask the question, but what about our God-given convictions? Humility in conclusions does not mean we question our convictions. Now, here's what I mean. We realize that we're operating with the information God has without the understanding and comprehension that God has. So the way we say it is information apart from understanding leads to multiple interpretations, right? That's why we have different types of churches. That's why we have different types of religions based off of Christianity because people had information, but they didn't have understanding. So it brought multiple people seeing those things differently. And because no matter how sound our judgment is, there's a good chance we've misjudged the situation if compared to the God in judgment all things appropriately. I'm, I'm going to draw a picture for you really quick. Um, so this week, I actually saw this on Facebook, and it blew my mind, and it brought me into this week. This is what I mean by this. It's a great thing. So let's say um, that we have a room, 
And in this room, we have two walls. This is wall one. This is another wall, okay? Sitting in this room, there is a cylinder just floating in the middle because it's magical. Magical cylinders are my favorite types of cylinders. Okay. Out of the cylinder, no one can see the cylinder. But what they can see is on this wall, from over here, there's a light source shining on this wall. Looking at the cylinder, do you know what shape this would be of a shadow? Right? That's the shadow. That's the shape. That's what you would see. But then if you put a light on this side and shined it this way, do you know what shape would be on that wall? Circle. Which one's wrong? Now, I'm not saying there's not wrong. There is sin in this world. There is right and wrong. And the burden we have is now we have the knowledge of good and evil, and we're trying to be the judges of it. And we have to think that maybe somewhere along the way, there might be some things we're misjudging. And it doesn't change you walking in your convictions. It doesn't change what the initial thing we should do. Do you remember the first thing I said we should do? is we should follow God's heart and not ours. And the good news for you and me is there's lots of opinions we don't have to have because God's shown it to us in Scripture. But when it comes to a conviction of the Holy Spirit that we don't find directly in, in Scripture, then we need to learn to walk with that conviction very humbly. Not righteous, but humbly. Because you know what? God might just be telling you that. It might be what you're struggling with and not them. Matthew 7, 2, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with that measure you use, it will be measured to you. And you're thinking this. And I'm going to get the worship team to come on up. But I want them to know the truth. I want you to know something. I want them to know the truth more than you do. I, if you don't know me, I want the world to know the truth because I think the truth will set us free. I want the world to know the truth because where there is a lack of truth, we begin to create our own narratives. And I think that we've fallen short of what God has for us because we've created a narrative because we didn't know the truth. I want them to know the truth. And I'm just going to tell you what I've decided to do. And personally, as your pastor, maybe your friend, maybe you don't consider me either one of those. But I have seen more ground when I've done these three things. Extend grace, release judgment, and live truth. See, God doesn't need perfect examples. He needs living examples. That comes from our friend Mike Breen. John, uh, John 3, 18, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with action and truth. I had uh, my mentor and the guy who discipled me for years um, taught me a discipleship model once that was working unbelievably well. And I asked him, how can I make my church do this? And he says, you will not get your church to do this. Because I, was, I wasn't the lead pastor. I wasn't an associate pastor. I was a youth pastor. And he's like, you're probably not going to implement a new process within your large church. And I felt really defeated. And he said, but you know what you can do? You can make disciples. And I was like, what? He's like, you can do what you want to implement. What if you did it and then... Next year, when they don't have disciples being made in their church, all of a sudden they look at you and see 8 to 12 people who've been raised up, been equipped, and are now making 8 to 12 other disciples. It won't take long before they call you and say, how can we implement this in our church? What if people, instead of us throwing up these massive declarations over their lives, instead started showing them lives that showed the results of the kingdom of God? I'm going to tell you, the best marriages are going to be had when we find people in this room who are willing to get their marriages right. And then our city looks at your marriages and says, what in yours in shambles last week? And now it looks like something I've never seen. They're going to come running to the truth. They're going to look at relationships and say, weren't you and your child like just not trusting each other for so long? And now how to like, I'm telling you now, living this truth, you are light in the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. And then the third thing I think God wants you to do is learn to look inward. Because the problem is not other people's sin, it's ours. And we have sins in our life that need to be repented of. Why do you Look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first, why don't you take the plank out of your own eye? Then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Can I tell you one of the things that um, I, I steer away from when I go to an optometrist is if I look at their glasses and they're really thick. 
I'm like, you don't have the vision to look at my vision, okay? Like, like I, if you don't have 20-20 vision as an optometrist, I don't want to see you. Like, because I don't want you pulling a knife towards my eye. I don't know if that's what optometrists do, surgeons do that. But I don't want you touching my eye if you can't see properly. And can I tell you, God's not telling us not to remove planks from other people's eyes, but he's saying you're going to do more damage trying to get it out when you can't see clearly past your own sin. You see, our own sins make us disqualified to judge other people's sins. Our sins don't discount the fact that there is sin, but the truth is we need to see that we are in sin. My wife hates gum. Do you know why my wife hates gum? Because she has the worst luck in the world. She steps and sits in gum everywhere she goes, and because of that, she despises it so much that she won't even chew it. Now, if you ask her, she'll tell you gum's gross, but she's not putting up things about gum, but what she is doing is she has found gum to be so gross that she doesn't even have it in her life. Like, like some of us are stepping in sin and sitting in sin so much, and we want to go around shouting to people about where the sin is instead of deciding to remove the gum from our own life, to not even chew it, to say, listen, I don't even want it near me because I just seem to fall into it everywhere I could go. You see, our, we should be rigorous, John Wesley says, in judging ourselves and gracious in judging others. So what do we need to do? Well, you need to receive grace, not condemnation. But to each one of us, Grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. See, I've looked inward, pastor, and I see sin. That's all I see, and you're correct. But remember, while you were still sinners, God demonstrates his love for us while you were still sinners. He died for you. Continual grace is in your life, but it's not an excuse for habitual sins. Grace isn't just to justify you. It's to sanctify you. It's actually provenient grace is what brought you to Jesus. Justifying grace is what saved you in your sin. And sanctifying grace, this word sanctifying, is mean God is trying to align your actions with your identity. You are sons and daughters of God, and it's time that we begin to act like it. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. See, God is not trying to limit your consumption to the good things of the garden. He's trying to open your eyes to everything you have in him. God's not hiding from you. He's watching every moment. Broken every time we choose something less than what he has for us. See, he's called us to come out of hiding and bring what you have to the Father. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid. I want to sing a chorus really quick of a song that we're going to learn today. I want you to hear this. When thinking of the garden, of you and your sin, and then God comes and he's looking and you're hiding, I want you not just to think about where you are, but God's heart for you for a moment. Will you just kind of just hear this, just hear this chorus for just a second. We don't need the words on the screen. We're just going to get Rachel to sing that really quick. Just hear this. read this passage again and we're gonna sing one more time but the Lord God called to the man where are you he answered I heard you in the garden I was afraid because I was naked so I hid and he said who told you you were naked God has understood in this moment that the things that we're believing are not the things he spoke to us but the lies the enemy has put in our hearts that has caused us to run and hide from him but God today is coming in pursuit of you because he's a gracious God and he's saying I'm not here to give you part of me I I'm here to give you all of me. Will you just hear it one more time over your life? So today, I want you to bring what you have. I want you to know that he has the rest. My son, Kai, everybody get a Lego piece? Y'all got Lego pieces? Pull those out. Me and my son, Kai, we love to build Legos. 
And when Kai does good or has some good days at school or a long period of time, one of the big things he gets is a Lego set. And that Lego set, it comes in a box and he gets to pick it by the design on the outside and it has a book and he build it and we build it together and we build it to its completion to exactly how it's meant to be. And then me as a father who knows the Legos ain't cheap, I take them and I sit them up on a shelf somewhere, right? Because I want them to last a little while. But with time, it comes off the shelf and it sits on a bench and off the bench and onto the Lego table. And then, God, and then Kai starts to add things onto it. And as he adds things onto it, I'm watching carefully because I know he's ruining the initial design. But then with time, it gets off balance and something happens and I'm watching and it falls and hits the floor and it falls into a million pieces. And I can see Kai's eyes, he panics. He panics because what he had worked so hard on has fallen apart. And he starts to grab every piece and he can look in his arms and realize he does not have all the pieces anymore. But what he doesn't understand is as a gracious father who knew the price that it cost for that entire set, I watched every piece as it fell. And I said, Kai, have you looked behind the chair? Have you looked under the couch? Did you see these pieces? Eventually we get all the pieces together and he realizes now I have all the pieces, but I don't know how it goes anymore. And then I remind him that I don't throw things away, that I actually had the book. I had the book. Do you know that Lego has a patent on taking the book and all the pieces and putting them in a box together? That's why they're so expensive. Not because of the Legos, anybody can make the Legos, but because of the book. And the book has how it was designed to be. And I said, so Kai, why don't you bring the pieces you have? I'm going to bring the pieces that I found and I have how it's meant to be designed so you don't have to rebuild something that looks similar to what it was because I have the book. I have it. And so your life that you're settling for goes, it's okay because when I get to heaven, it's going to be perfect. God's saying, I'm not hiding from you. Where are you? I'm in my sin. I've fallen short. I don't deserve to be in your presence. Who told you that? Who told you that? I didn't tell you that. I know where you left yourself. I know where your pieces fell. And I've come and brought it to you today. I'm tired. If you think you want the world to know the truth, you have no idea how much I want you to know the truth. You have no idea because I know the truth. And the truth is God doesn't want you to settle for anything less than he designed you to be. And when we settle for what God doesn't want us to be, then the world will never long to have what we have because they already have it. They already have a bunch of broken Lego pieces, a half design that can look something like God's intent, but nothing like his full intentions. So here's what we're going to do. We can just stand with me. We're going to worship together. I want you to know that God's, the results will be God's initial intent is his final decision. At the back, back here, we have a prayer altar, but there's also a table. I'm going to ask you, I know there's a lot of people in this room. I know we're late on time. So if you need to leave, I get it. But I want you to take that Lego piece just in the middle of this song at some point and just go stack it up there. Just resembling that you're bringing to God your peace, the peace that you have, and believing it at his feet so that he can actually bring what he has and build something great out of it. God, would you just move in this time of worship? May you be exalted, and may we bring who we are, because we're undeserving of your presence, but you bring it fully to us. Be with us in this moment.